Chapter Fourteen of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter Fourteen. Beauty is a witch. Much ado about nothing. I will tear the core out of many yellow pages of diffuse writing spiced with smug moral reflections. Desire Mitchell had been no traditional old hag, hideous and malevolent, no pallid, raving epileptic to accuse herself in shrieking tales of black men and sabbats and harm done to neighbors' cattle or crops. Her father was a clergyman who brought his goods and his motherless daughter from England to the colonies and settled in ye Pequot Marsh country. There he found a congregation, and they lived much respected. Their culture appeared to be far beyond that of their few hard-working neighbors. Young Mistress Mitchell was reputed learned in the use of simples, among other arts, and to have been of a beauty exceeding the custom among godly women to so great degree that sorcery should have been suspected of her. However, sorcery was not suspected, not even when her fame spread among near-dwelling Indian tribes, who gave her a name signifying water on which the sun is shining. Admiration was her portion, then, with all the suitors the vicinity held. But from fastidiousness or ambition, she refused every proposal made to her father for her. She walked aloof and alone, until another sort of wooer came to the gate of the minister's house. This man's full name was not given, apparently through the writer's cautious respect for place and influence. He was vaguely described as goodly in appearance, of high family, but not abundantly supplied with riches. However he chanced to come to the obscure settlement was not stated. He did come, saw Desire Mitchell, and fell as abjectly prostrate before her as any youth who never had left the village. He pressed his courtship hard and eagerly. At first he was welcome at the minister's house, but a day came when Master Mitchell forbade him to cross that door, and rumor whispered, scandalized, that Sir Austin's suit had not been honorable to the maid. Sir Austin sulked a week at the village inn. Then he broke under the torment of not seeing Desire Mitchell. Their betrothal was made public, and he rode away to prepare his home for their marriage in the spring. Travel was slow in the winter. News trickled slowly across snowbound distances. With spring came no bridegroom. Instead, word arrived of his affair with an heiress recently come to New York from England. She was rich in gold and grants of land from the crown. Her husband would be a man of weight and influence, it seemed. Sir Austin had married her. Desire Mitchell shut herself in her father's house. The clergyman did not live many months after the humiliation. Alone the girl lived. Student, wrote Abimelech Featherstone, of black and bitter art, or as some say having, like Bombastus de Hohenheim, a devil's bird enchained to do her will. In his distant home, Sir Austin sickened. He burned with fever. Anguish consumed him. Physicians were called to the bedside of the rich man. They could not diagnose his ailment or help him. He screamed for water. When it was brought, his throat locked and he could not swallow. He raved of Desire Mitchell, beseeching her mercy. In his times of sanity, he begged and commanded his wife and servants to send for the girl. In her pardon he saw his sole hope of life. Finally he was obeyed. Messengers were sent to the village. They were not even admitted to the house they sought, or to sight of Mistress Mitchell. 
Your master came himself to woo. Let him come himself to plead. That was the answer they received to carry back to the sick man. Sir Austin heard and submitted with trembling hope. Writhing in the anguish wasting him by day and night, he made the journey by coach and litter to Desire Mitchell's house. At her door sill he implored entrance and pity. The door did not open. It never opened for him. For three days in succession he was borne to her threshold, calling on her in his pain and fear. His servants and physician clustered about, staring at the house which stood locked and blank of response. At night, fireshine was seen from an upper room. Some declared they heard wild, melodious laughter. On the third day, Sir Austin died. A stern-faced deputation of men went to the house of the late clergyman. They found the door unlatched and open to their entrance. In the upper room they found Mistress Mitchell seated before her hearth, where a dying fire fell to embers, her hair flowing down in great beauty. "'What have I to do with Sir Austin, or he with me?' she calmly asked the men who gaped upon her. "'How should I have harmed him, who came not near him, as ye know?' Bury him, and leave me in peace. If she had been aged and ugly, she might have been hung. Gossip ran rife through the countryside, but indignation was strong against the man who had jilted the local beauty. There existed no proof of harm done, and the matter slept for a time. New matters came. A horror grew up around the house. The girl was seen flitting across the fields at dawn, a monstrous shadow following. Her voice was heard from the room where she locked herself alone, raised in unknown speech. Strange lights moved in her windows in the deep night. The old woman who had served in the house for years was stricken with a palsy and was taken away mumbling unintelligible things that iced the blood of superstitious hearers. There was a young man of the neighborhood whose love for Mistress Mitchell had been long and constant. One morning he was found dead on her doorstep, his face fixed in drawn terror. Under his hand four words were scrawled in the snow. Sarah, daughter of rule, there were those who could finish that quotation. Next Sabbath the new minister took as his text, Ye shall not suffer a witch to live. And he spoke of Sarah, the daughter of Rule, who was wed to ten bridegrooms, each of whom was dead on the wedding eve, for she was beloved by an evil spirit that suffered none to come to her. Authority moved at last against Desire Mitchell, but when the officers came to arrest her, she was found dead in her favorite seat before the hearth. Fair and upright in her place, scented with a perfume she herself distilled of her learning in such matters, which was said to contain a rare herb of Jerusalem called Lady's Rose, resembling spikenard, with vervain and cedar and secret simples in which she steeped her hair so that wherever she abode were sweet odors. So did she escape justice, but shall not escape hell's damnation and heaven's casting out. I closed the book and laid it down. Reading those dim, closely printed pages had taken time. I was astonished to find the window spaces gray with dawn when I glanced that way. The night was past. Neither from desire nor from the thing without a name which had sent me to this book could I find out what I was expected to glean from the narration. My enemy had made no conditions on directing me to the book. It had asked no price, uttered no menace. Why, then, had I so solemn a certainty that a crisis in our affair had been reached? 
I had come to an end. A corner had been turned. I had opened a door that could not be closed. How did I know this? Why? Why was the fog against the windows this morning so like the fog that shrouded the unearthly sea opposite the barrier? By and by, Christina came downstairs and busied herself in the kitchen. Bagheera, who had slept beside my chair all night, rose and padded out to the region of breakfast and saucers of milk. Next, the voices of Phillida and Vere drifted from above. To have Phillida find me there in her sewing-room, finishing an all-night vigil, invoked too many explanations. I did an unwise thing. From the lowest shelf of the bookcase, I gathered such books as were readable by my knowledge, and carried the armful up to my room. After a hot bath and breakfast, I would look over these companions of the New England witch book. End of chapter 14 Recording by Roger Moline